Hello, everyone. My name is Bruce Levy, for those of you who I haven't met. And we are just so delighted to welcome you to our fifth annual Lung Research Day. We have a broad and enlarging community of lung researchers of all stripes and feathers, and we're really excited to have everybody here today. We have a very special day ahead, and we have a very special guest, uh, Marlene Rabinovich, who's joining us from Stanford, and you're going to hear more about Marlene and more from Marlene in just a, a moment. Uh, on the next slide, I, I just wanted to highlight just a couple things before we get started. This is sponsored by the BRI's Lung Research Center and the Brigham Research Institute is a fantastic supportive organization for all uh, researchers. Um, they support our Lung Research Center in many ways. One of them is through this mock study section for those of you who are applying for grants, especially early stage investigators with any pulmonary related projects. You get feedback on your proposal by senior investigators. And our next one is coming up May 10th. And there'll be a, a link in the chat ultimately to apply. Please uh, submit your grant. You can see this testimonial from uh, one of now several people that have been able to have their grants reviewed. Uh, most of the people reviewing the grants are seasoned grant reviewers at the NIH. So it's almost like getting your A0 before you submit your grant to the NIH. So uh, please leverage this. Hopefully it will help. In the next slide, we have just a couple slides um, about upcoming funding opportunities. And uh, if Trey, if you could advance the slide. All right, so uh, there, these have some upcoming deadlines. Um, the Fund to Sustain Research Excellence, many of our community has, have leveraged this uh, to helpfully um, bridge you from a funded, a, a scored but not funded R01 uh, to actually funding. And you get $50,000 plus the indirects for one year. April 4th is the deadline for this coming up. So please plan to try to apply for this funding if it's relevant to where you're at. Bright Futures Prize, President's uh, Scholar Awards, uh, we'll link to these in, these funding opportunities, but the deadlines are like coming up fast on these. <laughs> uh, next slide. Thank you. There are some upcoming limited submission funding opportunities, the Pew, the Mathers Foundation, the V Foundation. If these are relevant to your work, please uh, try to um, put an application in for these. And then uh, next. Longevity uh, Foundation has some funds that are coming up. The letters of intent that were due February 23rd. So whether these uh, topics are related to your work, please consider if any of these are related. We'll put this information in the chat because I don't want to delay uh, the, the meeting any further. So in, I think the next slide is where I transition to my colleague Ed Silverman, who's also one of the co-directors of the Lung Research Center and he'll be introducing our special guest. Thank you very much, Bruce. Oh, I'm really honored uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Marlene Rabinovich uh, as our keynote speaker today. She's the Dwight and Vera Dunleavy Professor of Pediatric Cardiology at, at, at the Stanford uh, University School of Medicine. Uh, she graduated from McGill uh, uh, Medical School and then uh, did her pediatrics training at the University of Colorado and then actually did subspecialty training in cardiology at Boston Children's. Uh, and then she joined the Harvard Medical School faculty. She then moved to the University of Toronto, where she was a professor of pediatrics, medicine, and laboratory medicine and pathobiology. And she also directed the cardiovascular research program at the Hospital for Sick Children uh, before she moved to Stanford. She's received many awards for her research and mentoring. Uh, she also she was uh, selected to give the uh, ATS J. Burns Amberson uh, lectureship. She has served as a visiting professor in many countries and has uh, more than 200 uh, peer reviewed publications and more than 100 invited review articles and, and book chapters. She's uh, currently the director of the Basic Science and Engineering Initiative of the uh, Betty Irene Moore Children's Heart Center at Stanford. In addition, she's the associate director in basic research at Stanford's uh, Cardiovascular Institute. Her research focuses on uncovering the, the fundamental genetic metabolic and inflammatory mechanisms that cause pulmonary hypertension uh, and that uh, can be translated to the clinic. 
Her talk today is uh, entitled uh, Genetics and Inflammation Confer Converge and Inform Therapy for Pulmonary Arterial Hypertension. And I'd just ask you to, to place any questions you've got in the chat and we'll review them uh, after Dr. Rubinovich's uh, uh, presentation. So Marlene, welcome. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the introduction and the honor of, of being your keynote uh, speaker at the uh, Lung Research Day. So I'm going to try and share my screen uh, and see if we can play from start. Okay, can everybody see my slides? Can you see them? Looks great. Okay. Um, so we'll get going. And the, the topic today is genetics and inflammation converge and inform therapy for pulmonary arterial hypertension. If I could just move this out of the way. And I have no conflicts to disclose. So pulmonary hypertension is characterized by loss of peripheral vessels and occlusive proliferation of vascular cells and inflammation. So if you look at the arteriogram on the right-hand side, you'll notice extreme rarefaction of the distal pulmonary vasculature. And that's uh, based on apoptosis of endothelial cells or their vulnerability to apoptosis in response to injury and their inability to regenerate once they have been injured. But the narrowing, or uh, progressive narrowing, of the more proximal vasculature is due to a very exuberant proliferation of cells uh, in the neointimate that mostly have markers of smooth muscle cells, indicating that they might be derived from the muscular media, and they might be myofibroblasts in part, and they might be derived, at least in small part, based on some fate mapping studies and animal models from endothelial cells, and I'll show you some evidence for that too, that have undergone a mesenchymal transition. But part and parcel of the pathology uh, that keeps it going and keeps it progressive is in inflammation that's chronic and that invades uh, what's usually a protective barrier of the vasculature. And so you see inflammatory cells in the perivascular region, but also invading the vessel wall and sometimes from both sides. <clears throat> Our treatments to date, or at least approved treatments, are primarily vasodilators. When you think of even intravenous or subcutaneous prostaglandins and their derivatives, uh, their oral agents that are being investigated, they don't have the same efficacy. So oftentimes this is just the mainstay of therapy, in addition to endothelin receptor blockers and phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Um, and, and more and more of the field is pivoting to look at factors or agents that actually reverse the disease pathology. And don't just try and dilate what's already there because that really doesn't address why the disease is progressive and unrelenting. And contribute still, even with all these therapies, to a 65% uh, five-year survival. And that survival to transplant, uh, if you can get a transplant with its inherent morbidity and mortality, uh, but also to a, a quality of life that's far from perfect. Many patients that we have are on oxygen, they're not very mobile, et cetera. So we really need to face the biology of the disease if we're going to treat it more effectively. So the, the pulmonary hypertension, what makes it so interesting is that it's a complication of many different primary conditions uh, that all seem to evolve, at least in part, on this pathology that I'm going to just, just describe to you. So I became interested in pulmonary hypertension as a complication of congenital heart disease. Um, we see it now in the aging population, often disproportionate to stiff left ventricles in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, metabolic syndrome is increasingly being recognized as a risk factor for pulmonary arterial hypertension. And then it's prevalent, as, as you all know, in lung disease, sometimes disproportionate to the severity of the lung disorder. Sickle cell uh, disorders, again, sometimes disproportionate to any thromboembolic phenomena. Substance abuse uh, in, in terms of particularly the methamphetamines, uh, and then uh, other conditions that include infections, HIV, schistosomiasis, autoimmune conditions like scleroderma, and liver disease that's complicated by portal hypertension. 
But in each of these conditions, the incidence and severity of pulmonary hypertension often indicate that there are genetic factors involved in who gets it and who gets it with what severity. So the most insidious form of pulmonary hypertension is idiopathic. And it's insidious because the symptoms are very vague. You can get along with one lung if you don't exercise too much. And so patients frequently have very um, diffuse symptoms of fatigue and dyspnea and uh, uh, are often not even taken seriously by their physicians until somebody does an x-ray or electrocardiogram and, and sees a big heart. So this is a disorder that affects females more than males. The incidence is at least two to one. It's diagnosed in the third to fifth decade of life, but can occur in infancy and childhood where we see it. Uh, it's a rare condition, but 15% are familial. And um, there was a breakthrough in the year 2000, so a little over 20 years ago, when a mutation in BMPR2, one of the TGF beta family of receptors, uh, was identified as causal. It was seen in 70% of familial cases of pulmonary hypertension where there was more than one affected family member, uh, but it was also seen in about 20% of sporadic cases. But it wasn't taken too seriously sometimes because there were patients who were affected individuals with the same mutation in the family that never got the disease. Uh, but more and more, we appreciated that it was a necessary component. And, and that was also based on the fact that even if the condition wasn't idiopathic or familial, uh, there were frequently um, reduced expression of BMPR2. So, over the years, there's been a smattering of other mutations that have been associated with uh, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, familial or non-familial. Uh, and they include, as I've outlined in yellow, uh, members of the BMPR2 signaling pathway like SMAD9 or co-receptors like ALK1 or endoglin or TBX4 that actually produces um, ligands for BMPR2, CAV1 that associates with BMPR2, and EIF2A4K4 that's associated with you know, occlusive disease, but also has a connection with BMPR2. And then there are others where the connection is a little less well understood, uh, but they still tend to be rare relative to the BMPR2 mutation that is the prevalent one. So a number of years ago, we tried to understand why this receptor, its signaling pathway and its target genes were so important in maintaining vascular homeostasis uh, that losing BMPR2 seemed to be a prerequisite for developing pulmonary hypertension, uh, whether it was idiopathic or in response to another uh, stimulus. And so we showed that BMPR2 is important in promoting endothelial regeneration after injury, in preventing endothelial to mesenchymal transition, in mediating the release of extracellular vesicles that are protective. Uh, we also showed uh, that BMPR2 is very important in blocking proliferation of smooth muscle cells, uh, both by protecting the endothelium and also by having direct effects on smooth muscle cells. If you lose BMPR2 in smooth muscle cells, they become hyperproliferative themselves. It suppresses inflammation. We're going to talk a lot about that in this morning's discussion. Uh, it also induces DNA repair through uh, uh, P53 and other regulators like ATM. And uh, it's very important, interestingly enough, in cooperatively interacting with TGF beta in the assembly of elastin fibers. But I think for today, we're going to focus on the suppression of inflammation on um, inflammation in pulmonary arterial hypertension and how it conspires with uh, the impaired assembly of elastin fibers in uh, producing disease. So a number of years ago, we showed that BMPR2 limits recruitment of inflammatory cells. Uh, and it does so by regulating the translation of a key chemokine, GMCSF. This was the work of Hiro Sawada. And so what happens is if you stimulate endothelial cells with a cytokine TNF-alpha, but the endothelial cells are relatively deficient in BMPR2 by siRNA, you can double the amount of GMCSF that's produced, and it calls into the vessel wall GMCSF receptor alpha-positive cells that 
that in part co-distribute with CD68 positive cells with our monocyte macrophages. Now that explained perhaps an acute response, but we were or at least questioned or puzzled by what perpetuates inflammation. And the puzzle came to the foreground by work of Peros et al. It was published in 2012, where it was shown that in many cases, next to lesions that were partially or completely occluded, these tertiary lymphoid nodules were setting up house. And so we asked the question, what are these lymphoid nodules recognizing? Do the antibodies that they produce recognize specific or altered vascular alt antigens that are immunogenic and is what we're really studying an autoimmune disease. And so there was evidence of circulating autoantibodies, but we thought we really needed to get to the core of what the tertiary lymph node was recognizing. And to do so, what we did was we isolated lung immune complexes in collaboration with Bill Robinson using C3 capture, and we identified the antigens in those immune complexes uh, by mass spectrometry. And oddly enough, the major antigen that we detected in the immune complex was an antiviral protein, SAMHD1. It was increased in patients with pulmonary hypertension in their immune complexes compared to donor controls. But very little was known about SAMHD1 other than it was an antiviral protein in most of the literature related to its antiviral effects against um, um, HIV. And we knew that our patients didn't have HIV. These were explanted lung tissues from patients being transplanted. So we said, well, where is SAMHD1 at the tissue level? And we found it in endothelial cells. You can see the red von Willebrand factor staining in the green SAMHD1. We saw it in macrophages co-distributing with CD68. And we saw it in dendritic cells co-distributing with CD11C. Uh, so all these cells suggested that it was a real thing. Uh, but then it raised the question, what is an antiviral protein doing in idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension? So we collaborated with Charles Shu to, to interrogate the virome in the tissue sections from patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension or unused donor lungs as controls and didn't find any of the common viruses. We certainly didn't find HIV, uh, but what we did find were retroviruses of the HERV-K family. And we confirmed that in a larger series of patients and controls. And so uh, this was odd because we wondered, what are these HERV-K retroviruses? Why are they amplified in pulmonary hypertension? And how are they related to chronic immunity and inflammation? So endogenous retroviruses of the HERV-K and other families are uh, retroviral sequences that are stored in our genome as remnants of ancestral retroviral infections. So they're kept there and they're usually highly methylated, so they're not expressed. Although it's been shown that in embryonic cells, they are expressed to protect against um, viral um, um, infection as part of an innate immune response. They're not infectious because they've undergone mutations over millennia, but they're products, double-stranded RNA that they produce that can induce an interferon response, and proteins like DUTPAs and envelope proteins can induce a chronic innate immune response. And abnormal amplification, largely through demethylation of these sequences, has been linked to autoimmunity and cancer. So we looked to see if these uh, viral proteins from the HERV-K were produced and indeed uh, found them largely associated with CD68 cells. So this is immunoreactivity in green uh, for the HERV-K DUTPAs in a macrophage. And uh, when we took recombinant SAMHD1 that was produced by our collaborator, Dr. Maria Aritza, and stimulated pulmonary arterial endothelial cells with the recombinant protein, we found that uh, um, SAMHD1, uh, the antiviral protein, was increased in endothelial cells. So this appeared to be a protein that could be secreted and that could have a longer range effects in vascular cells and potentially in other cells in inducing an innate immune response. Interestingly, circulating monocytes in pulmonary hypertension that are recruited to the perivascular and vascular space uh, express high levels of um, HERV-K DUTPAs. 
And even in the plasma of patients with pulmonary hypertension, we can detect high levels of HERV KDUTPase protein. So it's an actively secreted protein, um, which we localize to monocytes and macrophages. So then if it's an actively secreted protein, does it impact vascular cells directly, uh, in addition to inducing the antiviral protein SAMHD1? So work that we recently published by Shichiro Otsuki, a postdoctoral fellow in our lab, showed that in response to the recombinant protein, HERF-KDUTPAs, there's initial endothelial apoptosis, and then the endothelial cells hang on uh, by losing their endothelial uh, specific genes and gaining smooth muscle genes in a process called mesenchymal uh, transition from endothelial cells or an endothelial mesenchymal transition. And this has various adverse sequelae because when endothelial cells no longer are endothelial cells, they fail to produce factors like apolin that keep smooth muscle cells in check and inhibit their proliferation. Uh, they fail to maintain their junctions and so uh, there's reduced barrier function, permitting substances that shouldn't get into the subendothelial space to get there. And they lose their anti-inflammatory properties and actually gain pro-inflammatory properties. So just to show you an example of his work, um, here are some endothelial cells in culture, and you can see the control endothelial cells that are unstimulated, have nice V cadherin boundaries, uh, which are lost when you stimulate the cells just after a couple of days with herb KDOTPAs. And you can see the faint red background of these cells indicating the expression of smooth muscle actin. And here are the uh, quantitative data by Western blot. So snail slug, the major transcription factor uh, that's activated and important in the process of endothelial mesenchymal transition is upregulated. I'll show you how in a moment. Uh, the endothelial proteins, V, cadherin, CDH5, and PCAM are suppressed, and the smooth muscle proteins like ACTA2 are increased. Uh, and these are just the quantitative data below that's uh, taken from the Western. So then the question was, well, do we see evidence of endothelial mesenchymal transition in our vasculature? And, and uh, other investigators had indeed um, seen this. Uh, we went specifically to look for snail and slug and found it in endothelial cells. So it's red, von Willebrand factor is green, and this is a vessel that's almost completely occluded. And we also co-stained snail and slug for the smooth muscle, a factor acted to, and you can actually see some cells in the uh, neointima uh, that are positive both for snail slug as well as for the smooth muscle marker ACTA2. So in part, um, endothelial mesenchymal transition contributes to the development of the neointima, but it's not the whole explanation. Uh, the smooth muscle cells that are coming from the media and the myofibroblasts are also important contributors, are as, as are inflammatory cells. Dan Greif actually showed that they could morph into smooth muscle cells. But the question was, how does this occur? Does this occur by a secreted molecule? Does it occur by a secreted molecule potentially in an extracellular vesicle? So we set up these co-culture systems in which uh, we used a monocyte cell line, THP. Uh, we use that at the top of a membrane, or we added these cells to the top of the membrane, and the, the bottom of the well, we grew smooth muscle cells. And then for good measure, we blocked herf KDUTPAs either with an antibody or with IgG isotope control. And what you can see right away is that the nice cobblestone monolayer in our endothelial cells that were co-cultured with monocytes that just express GFP um, maintain the cobblestone monolayer. Uh, but if the monocytes were engineered to overexpress herf KDUTPAs, uh, the cells started to look more mesenchymal, less so when we blocked them with the herf KDUTPAs antibody, uh, and this is IgG as a control. And, and then quantitatively, the upregulation of snail was inhibited, uh, the downregulation of PCAM was inhibited by the antibody, the upregulation of ACT as well as IL-6, which is part and parcel of uh, endothelial mesenchymal transition is up in the endothelial cells uh, with herv KDUTPAs, but down when we block it. And the same is true for the leukocyte adhesion molecule, VCAM. Uh, so it looked like herv KDUTPA secreted from monocytes uh, was capable of inducing uh, EMT. 
and capable of having long range effect. And we also found herv KDUTPAs in extracellular vesicles shown here by a Western blot. It's not perfect, but it took a lot of extracellular vesicles to bring out the difference uh, in the monocytes that just express GFP uh, and the monocytes that express herv KDUTPAs when we isolated extracellular vesicles. So then the question was, well, could we take extracellular vesicles uh, from uh, monocytes that overexpress herb KDUTPAs, EVH, as opposed to EVG, those that overexpress GFP or vehicle, and just periodically inject them into animals and see if they were sufficient uh, to induce pulmonary hypertension. We had done this before, actually, with a recombinant protein and, and did show that the recombinant protein could induce pulmonary hypertension. And sure enough, after about five weeks, right ventricular systolic pressure was elevated elevated as was right ventricular hypertrophy, uh, and you could see an increase in the muscularization of the distal vessels. That's one of the earliest features of pulmonary hypertension. So in and of themselves, they were capable of inducing this remote effect even when you injected them peripherally. And you can see evidence of transformation because the mice we used were engineered uh, to have endothelial cells that express TD tomato. Uh, and so here they are. And you could see when they transform, uh, the cytoplasm starts to express ACTA2 or smooth muscle alpha actin. So EMT was in fact going on uh, at the local pulmonary endothelial level. So then how is it happening? And it was a rather complex uh, web to unravel. What we found that TL was the TLR4 MyD88 engages her KDUTPAs as does MCAM, and both can activate NF-kappa B through phosphorylation of P38. Uh, NF-kappa B was necessary. If we blocked it, we didn't get EMT, uh, but it wasn't sufficient. Uh, so snail and slug, uh, was the SMAD3 pathway, not surprisingly, because TGF-beta can induce endothelial mesenchymal transition, although TGF-beta didn't appear to be directly involved. We blocked it, we still got it. And then uh, STAT1 uh, wasn't required for the induction of IL-6. And then engagement of MCAM and ERK. Uh, ATF2 uh, was responsible for the upregulation of uh, leukocyte adhesion via VCAM. So, uh, so HERFK actually had to engage two different receptors to affect this whole scenario. And it couldn't do so uh, by being secreted directly from monocytes or uh, being exteriorized in monocyte extracellular vesicles. So if the monocytes were so abnormal in pulmonary arterial hypertension, uh, could another myeloid cell, the neutrophil, also be very abnormal? So this is work that has been uh, resubmitted for publication, hopefully will be out soon, uh, by Shay Taylor, in which we uh, took neutrophils from patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, isolated them, and asked whether they produce more neutrophil elastase. Um, and indeed they do. And this has also been shown in patients with COPD. And then we asked whether the elastase wasn't just the protein, but was actually an active enzyme. So we stimulated them with IL-8. And sure enough, we found that there was increased released elastase activity. And then we asked whether the elastase could even have an intracellular function in releasing chromatin when we stimulated the cells with PMA. Uh, and this process is called net formation or nuclear chromatin extracellular traps, uh, which is a pathogenic response to a stimulus. Uh, it's thought to be a beneficial pathogenic response if there's a bacteria, uh, because the bacteria or the pathogen can actually be trapped in the chromatin. And it requires elastase to break the nuclear uh, envelope to actually release uh, the net, but there is collateral damage because the elastase comes along with the chromatin and can actually uh, cause damage to vascular cells and, and other tissues. So uh, sure enough, there were more nets and more exuberant nets released in, in uh, neutrophils from patients with pulmonary hypertension, and it was elastase mediated in that when we used a recombinant form of human neutrophils Trophil elastase inhibitor elephant, we could suppress the process in the pH cells. And these are just the quantitative data on the right-hand side. 
So then we asked whether there were other features that were abnormal in these neutrophils as well. And we found that they were more adherent uh, to fibronectin. They expressed high levels of integrin beta-1. And then when we added neutrophils to our endothelial cells sitting on the top of the membrane and asked how easy it was for pH versus control neutrophils to transverse the endothelial barrier, it was easier when we used pulmonary arterial endothelial cells from patients with pulmonary hypertension. But when we used neutrophils from patients with pulmonary hypertension, they got stuck and couldn't cross the control endothelial barrier or the PAH endothelial barrier. So then we started to ask, why are they adherent and why do they get stuck and not migrate very well or emigrate very well? And so we carried out a proteomic analysis looking for factors that might be contributing to this phenomenon. And of course, increased adhesion and transendothelial migration came up on the uh, GO map, but the central node was really appeared to be regulated uh, by a protein called vinculin, shown here. Uh, and vinculin can uh, repress RAC2, which is important in migration. Uh, so vinculin was definitely upregulated um, in the cells and the neutrophils from patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, so that all fit. Uh, and then we asked, um, where it is. And of course, it's an actin binding protein that's seen at the uh, very periphery of the cells uh, that can interact with beta integrins and actually uh, promote cell adhesion to endothelial, uh, neutrophil cell adhesion to endothelial cells. But we found that it was also a very interesting protein that had an antiviral function uh, because vinculin can actually limit retroviral entry and replication, going back to our retrovirus story. Uh, so for example, if you increase the concentration of vinculin, uh, shown by Brown et al., uh, you can decrease the expansion of HIV colonies. So that made even more sense when we looked to see or wondered whether or not HERF-K DGPAs that secreted by monocytes could be upregulating uh, vinculin as part of an immune response. And so, as I showed you before, uh, HERF-K DUTPAs is elevated in the plasma. And when we exposed HL60 cells, which is a neutrophil cell line to HERF-K DUTPAs, vinculin was upregulated. So that kind of fit. And then uh, vinculin could explain the increased adhesion because when we knocked it down and stimulated the cells with HERV-KDUTPAs, the increased adhesion that you see here was greatly diminished down to control levels. So then the plot thickened when we did the transcriptomic analysis of our pH neutrophils, because what we saw was a very profound antiviral response uh, with two molecules that transduce the viral signal, PKR and RIGI, I'll show you in a moment, interferon alpha and interferon gamma receptors, uh, and a ubiquitinase is actually uh, downregulated. Uh, we interrogated more conclusively and said, okay, could there be double-stranded RNA released from an endogenous HERF and that is stimulating the interferon response? And that could contribute to pulmonary hypertension because patients on interferon ther therapy are susceptible to pulmonary hypertension has been shown by a number of, invest of investigators. We didn't find the DUTPAs in the cells, but we found evidence of the HERV-K envelope protein in the neutrophils. It was clearly abundant uh, by confocal immunofluorescence. So then we said, okay, if we overexpress in a neutrophil cell line, the HERV-K envelope, uh, do we increase neutrophil elastase as part of an innate immune response? And do we turn on the interferon machinery with RIGI and PKR? This is the mRNA level and it appears to be the case. Uh, and this just shows you that we were able to confirm the increase in neutrophil elastase by overexpressing HERV-K uh, in this promyelocyte cell line uh, where there's abundant production of messenger RNA for elastase. So then we asked again, well, it's been shown by others in COPD that neutrophil elastase can be released in extracellular vesicles. Do we see neutrophil elastase in extracellular vesicles that we isolate with CD66B from patient plasma? And sure enough, we do. And we also see it traveling along with HERV-K. 
Uh, this is CD9, which is just a marker of the extracellular vesicles, and these are the quantitative data here. Uh, and then we also confirmed that in the neutrophil elastase on the surface of these extracellular vesicles was biologically active uh, by elastase activity. Uh, so then we asked a very similar question to the one we asked with the monocytes. Could we take the extracellular vesicles from patients with pulmonary hypertension, pretreat them with the elastase inhibitor elephant or not, uh, versus control extracellular vesicles were also just from control plasma, but also neutrophil extracellular vesicles. And with the former, uh, the EVs from the patients with pulmonary hypertension induced pulmonary hypertension. And the answer was yes, except if we pretreated them with the elastase inhibitor in terms of right ventricular pressure, right ventricular hypertrophy, and increased muscularization shown here of distal vessels. Uh, so that fit. And so the story was, still has a lot of holes and, and, and questions uh, that we haven't answered. Uh, something uh, which we think is a decrease in amethylase, but why we're not sure, methylase cap one, uh, we think it may have to do, and we can discuss this in the discussion a little bit later, with the regulation of HERB2 by the exist link RNA on the X chromosome. But we can go into that a little bit later because it's speculative. So HERVK is upregulated at the message level, uh, and that turns on the interferon machinery. And by some mechanism, it also induces neutrophil elastase, which makes neutrophils prone to release nets and, um, and to release both elastase and HERVK in extracellular vesicles. And then by a cell non-autonomous mechanism through monocytes, HERVK DUTPase is released, engages receptors in the neutrophil and increases vinculin, um, decreasing RAC2, which is important in increased cell adhesion and reduced migration. So the neutrophils get stuck and when they get stuck, there's more opportunity for them to get activated and release nets and do damage. So then we asked, um, is, is this something we can actually show at the tissue level? And it required a collaboration uh, with uh, folks at Stanford who had developed and in fact invented a way to study not just several antigens on the cell surface, but multiplexing uh, with multiple antigens because each antibody for those antigens was linked to a mass element uh, that could be recognized by a mass spec and actually color codified. Uh, so here you see we were able to interrogate our tissue sections with antibodies that recognize non-immune cells, immune cells, various states of activation, antigen presentation, metabolism, et cetera, to get a better, better handle because you'd be questioned, do neutrophils actually even get into the uh, distal vasculature? So this was work done in collaboration with Mike Angelo, who developed the technique in Gary Nolan's lab and Selena Ferrian, a postdoctoral fellow. And not surprisingly, there was just about everything that was on the surface and invading the vessel walls. So every single immune cell was actually upregulated, uh, but some tracked a little bit better than others with disease pathology. And so we graded the lesions and found, interestingly enough, and we had six patients with HPAH with a BMPR2 mutation, so they were hereditary, and six where there was no known mutation. And there were more neutrophils associated with the lesions in the patients with the BMPR2 mutations. Not surprisingly, if loss of BMPR2 is important in recruiting these cells through GMCSF, uh, it also tracked with more smooth muscle cells in the lesions of patients with hereditary pulmonary hypertension, not surprising because Ruben Tudor has shown that the pathology is worse in patients with hereditary pulmonary hypertension. And in fact, uh, there was a correlation between the smooth muscle cells and the neutrophils that was direct uh, and driven by the HPAH subgroup. And we've shown that the extracellular vesicles from the patients with hereditary pulmonary hypertension uh, can in fact induce uh, smooth muscle cell proliferation, which also wasn't surprising because many years ago, we showed that leukocyte elastase can mediate mitogenic activity in pulmonary artery smooth muscle cells by release of extracellular matrix bound fibroblast growth factor. We showed with loss of BMPR2 in, in hereditary pulmonary hypertension, there would be more GMCSF mediated recruitment of GMCSF positive neutrophils as well as monocytes. And I'm gonna show you in a moment that uh, 
as a perfect storm, loss of BMPR2 also renders elastin fiber is susceptible to degradation by elastase. So this is work that was carried out by um, uh, Nancy Toja when she was in the lab. And it was known that TGF-beta can upregulate elastin and its scaffolding protein fibrillin to make elastin fibers. But what wasn't known is that if you block BMPR2, this doesn't happen. So a signal is required from BMPR2 to affect uh, TGF-beta's manufacturing of elastin fibers. And in fact, BMP can directly manufacture elastin fibers. And both BMP and TGF-beta are stored uh, bound to molecules on elastin fibers. And uh, this was published a few years ago. So if you lose BMPR2, you get poorly assembled elastin fibers, which we also uh, showed in that publication. And just to show you a little bit of data, if you take smooth muscle cells or fibroblasts, stimulate them with BMP4 five to seven days, you'll see dense elastin fibers. If you take pulmonary hypertensive smooth muscle cells or fibroblasts, they produce flimsier fibers. And if you take uh, the cells from patients with a BMPR2 mutation, that's even more egregious in culture. You get very little assembly. Uh, and if you look at the lesions, and this is partly due to elastase, but also the vulnerability of the elastin fibers to degradation, you see more evidence of degradation of elastin, particularly in the mutant patients, uh, more greater loss of fibrillin as well uh, compared to the controls shown on the far left. So loss of elastin creates a particular vulnerability. It increases vascular stiffness by changing the ratio of elastin to collagen. Uh, Bob Meekham showed many years ago, as well as we did, that loss of elastin itself can promote smooth muscle cell proliferation. Uh, the transgenic animal that lacks elastin dies because of coronary occlusion. Um, there's also pulmonary vascular occlusion. Uh, loss of elastin makes even small microvessels uh, vulnerable to uh, apoptosis and loss. Uh, and elastin breakdown products, Bob Sr. showed many years ago, are pro-inflammatory to monocytes, the elastin fragments. But what we found was quite serendipitous, because as I mentioned before, we've been using a recombinant form of the human elastase inhibitor elephant to suppress elastase activity. Uh, but what we also recognized was as an early feature of using this inhibitor was restoration of endothelial health. And so we asked whether or not there could be an off-target effect of elephant in activating the BMP receptor. And in fact, what elephant does is it maintains the BMPR2 receptor more tightly bound to caviolin, as we've shown by co-IP studies. And that seems to transduce a weak signal into a stronger signal by a weaker or less efficient or less prevalent receptor. And so you can amplify BMP signaling by adding elephant. And this was work, uh, again, published by Niels Nickel a number of years ago. And he used the Sujin hypoxia animal that shows occlusion of distal vessels. He let the animal develop pulmonary hypertension by blocking the VEGF receptor initially, uh, and then exposing the animals to three weeks hypoxia, maintaining the animals in normoxia, and then beginning the treatment when the disease was well advanced. And of course, what he found was reversal of pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular hypertrophy, and opening up of these occluded and muscularized distal vessels. So then we asked, well, we're ready to go. And in fact, we've got through a phase one trial with no toxicity and are gearing up for a phase two clinical trial with elephant. Uh, but what always worries us is the next step, uh, and it should, as to whether or not who will respond and if they will respond and how we can even begin to think about how to stratify patients that might respond to therapy. So a number of years ago, in response to an RFA by the NIH, we took on the project of making iPSC-derived endothelial cells uh, from patients with pulmonary hypertension. And we thought we had a unique opportunity because we culture cells from the lungs of patients at the time of explant, uh, at the time of transplantation. And we could persuade the surgeons at the same time that we harvest the endothelial cells to give us a bit of skin from the incision site uh, to reprogram and to make into induced pluripotent stem cell derived endothelial cells. And what we found was that if the PAECs from patients didn't form tubes well in culture and didn't perform well, so did their iPS endothelial cells, uh, which, which initially surprised me, but 
They were very patients that responded, responded well to elephant in forming nice tubes. The native cells did it and the iPS endothelial cells did it. And those who were sluggish were sluggish both by their native cells and their iPS endothelial cells. So they were a very good mirror for whatever reason, probably because idiopathic pulmonary hypertension is largely genetic of what was going on in the lung. This was the work of Celine Sa. So more recently, we took another strategy and said, well, we're going forward with elephant, but is there something else on the back burner that we should have cooking? And could we do a high throughput screen to look not just at agents that activate BMPR2 or suppress inflammation, but, but agents that actually restore endothelial health? So we took seven lines of iPSCs that had been reprogrammed from fibroblasts. We made endothelial cells. We've also made smooth muscle cells that don't produce elastin and call it, and uh, fibrillin well and, and are hyperproliferative. So they, they do resemble the native cells very uh, effectively. Uh, and then we subjected them to a library of compounds that were in various stages of clinical development at various doses. And we asked as a screening tool whether they survived better if we re removed heparin, uh, removed heparin, removed uh, serum uh, from the medium as a first pass uh, by luminometer. Uh, and then we got rid of cells that could have had a toxic effect and actually had low caspase because they weren't there. Uh, and then we uh, went further and made sure that these cells really had good restoration of health by performing well in uh, matrigel cultures by um, exhibiting tube formation. Uh, and then our positive hits were taken a step further uh, by showing that they could decrease smooth muscle cell proliferation. So we had multiple agents that worked across all seven lines seemingly equally effectively. Uh, this was a work just recently published by Min Shigu. So here you have it. They all perform well. They all make nice angiogenic tubes uh, compared to DMSO, which is the vehicle. Um, no serum involved in the procedure of, of low growth factor matrix gel. So how do we choose between them? So we collaborated with Michela Donati in the Catri lab, and they had developed a pH signature uh, for multiple publicly available pulmonary arterial hypertension tissue data sets. Uh, so blue are the genes that are downregulated, red are the genes that are upregulated, and then it's easy computationally to develop an anti-signature. And they interrogated all our successful compounds against this database to say which ones best match the anti-signature. And two came to the foreground, this tyrosine kinase inhibitor AG and risperidone but resveratrol really didn't perform well in any of our assays, not nearly as well as uh, AG. So we went with AG as our lead compound. And sure enough, AG uh, didn't have any of its known tyrosine kinase inhibitory effects uh, that duplicated its beneficial effects in increasing expression, not just of BMPR2, uh, but the co-receptors 1A and 1B. And uh, the proteins were affected, so was the signaling. When we gave AG, uh, we could show that we affected the canonical PSMAD15 signaling pathway, the transcription factor ID1 was turned on and all the beneficial genes, apolin that I mentioned before, BRK3, which is anti-apoptotic, VEGFA, folostatin, were turned on by AG. Uh, so it had tremendous salutary effects in endothelial cells, not only by upregulating the receptors and co-receptors for BMPR2, uh, but also this very important co-activator that other tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib didn't upregulate and didn't have the same signaling potential uh, through the BMPR2 pathway. Pathway. Uh, so CREB is a SMAD15 coactivator, and it explained why AG was able to more effectively induce ID1 uh, and genes that were important in endothelial angiogenesis than other tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, worked well in organ culture in inducing apoptosis of smooth muscle cells and opening up the vessel lumen. It worked well in the Sujin hypoxia and that, uh, rat in opening up the occluded small vessels and reversing pulmonary hypertension. So what I've shown you so far um, together is that in pulmonary hypertension, loss of BMPR2 promotes recruitment of myeloid cells that express HERVs, monocytes that pr promote endothelial mesenchymal transition through HERVK DUTPAs and neutrophils with increased elastase that induce smooth muscle cell proliferation and a chronic interferon response.
The neutrophils track with more severe vascular pathology that's seen in patients with a BMPR2 mutation. Loss of BMPR2 renders elastin fibers susceptible to elastase-mediated degradation. An elephant and elastase inhibitor also increases BMPR2 function and is moving to a phase two trial. And AG also improves BMPR2 function. So we're keeping it on the back burner and hope that it will also be developed uh, for patients that may not respond as effectively to elephant. Uh, so I'd just like to acknowledge the fellows that I've mentioned during the course of this presentation, as well as our collaborators, uh, Maria, who supplied the HERF KDU TPAs, Oliver, who supplies the uh, elephant, and uh, uh, multiple um, tremendous collaborators at Stanford who've helped us uh, design and implement the studies that I've spoken to you about today, and of course, our funding agencies, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. That was... Uh really amazing uh, and just uh, just a tour de force. I, I'd ask folks to put questions uh, in the chat while, while we're waiting for that to happen. Um, you, you pointed out at the beginning that there's a heterogeneous uh, set of conditions that lead to pulmonary arterial hypertension. Do you think that the the, the, the pathways that you found particularly related to the, the, the HERF-K DUTPAs will be related to all of those causes of pulmonary arterial hypertension or only to a subset? Well, I wonder, the, the first one I would look at would be tissue from patients with autoimmune disease, where they have been implicated for sure, um, and, and where you see a strong inflammatory component, and then the infectious disease like schistosomiasis and, and mm -hmm. HIV for sure. Mm -hmm. um, whether we see this the same way in the others, but of course we stuck to the HPH, IPH just because it's a more uniform group and, and a more abundant group. In, in, mm -hmm in terms of the tissue uh, bank that we have. Uh, but I think going forward, we need to look at the other causes as well. Wonderful. Um, let's see, so we've got a few questions that are uh, appearing in the chat. Um, a question from uh, Hassan Khalil. Um, does the bronchial circulation contribute to the inflammation you described in PAH? Have you noticed changes to bronchial vessels and would modulating the bronchial blood flow have any effect on the disease? Yeah, we haven't tested that, but of course, a number of investigators uh, uh, on both continents have shown that uh, bronchial anastomoses do occur uh, with a distal pulmonary circulation. Um, they tend to occur in vessels that are occluded or partially occluded. So the question is the flow over time probably diminishes and yet the disease progresses. Uh, could they be the source of inflammatory cells? They could be as well as the vasovasorum uh, that are associated with the adventitial space uh, that Kurt Stenmark has shown are important in, in recruiting uh, monocytes and macrophages. So I think it's an all, all assault on the vessel wall. You uh, compromise the endothelial lining uh, and you also compromise the uh, privilege of the vascular region uh, by, by the uh, permitting cells to get through the adventition to the vessel wall. Mm -hmm. A question from Josh Boyce. Can you comment on whether you think mast cells are involved in the PAH pathogenesis? Yeah. Dr. Galley always asks me that as well. And you know, there's so few that we can detect circulating and in the tissue that we can't say for sure. And you know, we were reluctant even on the MIBI studies to call them out because um, at least in our in the idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, the hereditary, there were so few of them. Uh, that we didn't want to make sweeping conclusions. But that having been said, as we've discussed earlier today and before. Uh, there is the house dust mite model produces tremendous neoentomal formation in the mouse, uh, much more than it does uh, by increasing airway smooth muscle, for example. So, uh, so there must be certain types of um, pulmonary hypertension where mast cells play a lot more important role than we've recognized. Great. And then a final question from Bruce Levy with. Uh, Herve's involvement of both monocytes and neutrophils, does this imply involvement of a bone marrow myeloid progenitor? Is PAH impacted by, uh, by CHIP? And is it possible to treat PAH by bone marrow transplantation? 
that's been thought of. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's, only, it's been tried experimentally with the caviolin one mutant mouse uh, to actually transplant the bone marrow. And that animal didn't develop more severe pulmonary hypertension in response to hypoxia compared to the animal transplanted with its, its own or bone marrow from the same um, uh, transgenic animal. So, so it, it does suggest that um, it may be possible to do, people have been reluctant because these patients are so fragile. It's a big procedure. Um, on the other hand, uh, it, it certainly merits consideration. And it, it does speak to a progenitor cell that somehow in some way, uh, this, um, there's a susceptibility to demethylation of these retroviral elements. Um, when I, when I first spoke about this, Joe Lascalza challenged me to make, to see if, if we could detect HERVs in iPS uh, cells, and we do. So, and those cells are reprogrammed by an inflammatory stimulus, right? Uh, it actually induces an innate re immune response, but there were more HERVs in the pH cells than in the controls. So they are susceptible to increased expression at a very early stage. Great, and then the last question from uh, K1. <laughs> Uh, could you comment on the tertiary lymphoid structures uh, next to the PAH vessels? And do you think that lymphatic vessels may play a role in pH? Again, you know, not well studied at all in pulmonary hypertension because uh, they're hard to study. Um, but we do see dilated lymphatics um, that we haven't paid as much attention to as we should. And we should definitely look at that, in, particularly in some of our experimental models, but even at the level of the tissue. So again, something is bringing all these cells to bear to present antigens to, to set up local shock near the vessel wall. They have to be involved in, in the tertiary lymphoid, I would think. Well, wonderful. Thanks again for, for such a spectacular talk. I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Rafael Bueno, who's gonna uh, introduce our poster session. Thank you and a great talk. Uh, at this point, we'll move to the poster sessions. There are four different poster sessions uh, uh, you know, for the next half hour, you're invited to participate in them. Each of the four, the lung cancer phenotyping, uh, the molecular profiling and asthma, basic mechanism and lung, lung pathobiology and clinical uh, imaging and diagnostic and lung and pulmonary disease are moderated by one of our uh, uh, members. And, uh, you know, if you look at uh, it, it, uh, how to find it, Trey just uh, sent uh, the links. So, so I think that's what I'm supposed to introduce and you can go for it. Thanks, Rafael. And um, here are some instructions on how to enter the Frank Al rooms on your Zoom screen. So we'll see you all there. So uh, the first thing that I want to go over is the Bell Family Research Accelerator Endowment. It's, it's uh, a gift that we raised, Bruce and I raised from the Bell family. The, the Mike Bell uh, and his wife Lee Bell were, are heavily involved with the Brigham for over 20 years since when he was at the head of the board of trustees, there's the Bell Family Center, there's the Bell Professorship, and so on. And, and they've been supportive of the Lung Center here, and they donated a gift that generates about $50,000 a year uh, is signed to uh, two uh, um, uh, small grants to support innovation. Uh, and this year, uh, you want to get to the next slide, uh, or is there one slide? Uh, there you go. So these are the winners this year. Uh, both of them are collaborations between uh, a, a junior investigator, first Eddie Kim in uh, pulmonary, with some uh, collaboration with a senior mentor in thoracic, and then vice versa in uh, uh, with Hisashi Tsukada uh, with a collaborator in pulmonary. Uh, this money is endowed in perpetuity. So every year 
uh, uh, the divisions will select uh, uh, the two winners of this award. So thank you. Uh, so this is to highlight the winners as well as to highlight this particular award for pretty much anything in lung research. Next, please. So the committee reviewed the posters uh, uh, a week or two ago and identified uh, the honorable mentions and the winners. And there is there are prizes for the winners, and and it was done equitably among the divisions that contributed research to the lung center, including Channing pulmonary allergy surgery. Uh, so let's you want to go through the lists. So, Dr. Wang, Dr. Chen. Dr. Morrow, Dr. Young, Dr. Raki, Dr. Tang, Dr. Pajanen, and Dr. Sadek were all honorable mentions. Uh, and I hope you got a chance to look at their posters and their posters are available uh, later on the sites for view. Thank you and congratulations. Now, there were several winners and I think we'll be going through the posters. Uh, first one is uh, by Dr. Derek Kashen, who's gonna talk about TGF beta as centrality in human Epithelial mast cell phenotype. Here comes the mast cells again. We're finding them everywhere. Go for it. Is there voice associated with this, Trey? Sorry, are you, are you able to hear it? Yes. Okay. cells are often referred to as MCP as opposed to some epithelial muscles that have both tryptophan and term MCP. Can you increase However, the volume, Trey? MCP. Yeah. Let me try to reshare it. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. That was good for a second. <laughs> Hi, everyone. One of the defining characteristics of human intrapetidial muscle cells, the subset that selectively expands during type 2 inflammatory airway diseases such as asthma and nasal polyposis, is of the Proteus chymis in their granules. These cells are often referred to as MCT, as opposed to subepithelial muscles that have both triptis and chymase termed MCTC. However, the mechanism governing the development of these chymase deficient MCTs is unknown. We previously found a role for TGF beta in driving mouse intrapetelial muscle phenotype and hypothesized that TGF beta plays a similar role in humor. Supporting this, we found that human TGF beta signature genes were significantly enriched in muscles with an epithelium in nasal polyps that we profiled using single cell RNA sequencing, suggesting that TGF beta signaling contributes to the intrapetelium muscle transcriptome. In further support, TGF beta selectively downregulated MCTC signature genes, including Porteus kinase. We confirmed through flow cytometry that growing muscles in the presence or absence of TGF beta resulted in cultures of MCTs or MCTCs, respectively, which gave us a powerful tool to start to unravel how MCT and MCTC can contribute to inflammation. TGF beta differentially regulated several transcripts associated with lipid mediator biosynthesis, particularly PGD2 and LTC4 that are elevated in patients during inflammation. 
we found that our in vitro MCTs had enhanced production of cesalpies and PGD2. We observed the same pattern in primary intraepithelial MCTs from nasal polyps stimulated ex vivo as compared to subepithelial MCTCs. Finally, as the nasal polyp master populations show the differential expression for a few of the inflammatory mediators, we hypothesized that TGF beta could also modulate muscle cytokine secretion. Indeed, priming with TGF beta enhanced muscle production of IL-5, but suppressed IL-13 and CCL2 release following IL-33 activation, mirroring the transcript expression measured in MCTs versus MCTCs. In conclusion, TGF beta drives the intraepithelial muscle phenotype reprogramming mass of protease expression and for inflammatory mediator production. Thank you so much for your attention. And I think that, did someone tell Dr. Rabinovich that she has to ask the question? Uh, no, they didn't tell me, but I'm happy to do that. Fire up. Okay, that's great. I really enjoyed your presentation. So, so tell me how it works. How does TGFA to do all these things? Do you know uh, much about the G, you know, how it, is it a, a canonical pathway? Is it, if you were to intervene, you know, the, the main concern is to block TGFA to completely. Is there some way to intervene in a way that might be more targeted uh, by knowing more about the pathway? Yes, that's a very good question. We actually um, have found a few transcription factors that are uh, upregulated, which are associated with the TGFA to signaling, including SKIL. Uh, which is upregulated in uh, intraepithelial mast cells which versus uh, sub the mast cells that are in the subepithelium. Mm -hmm. And uh, that could be a target for uh, looking into TGF beta signaling further. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, I, think, I think because Trey put us on a very tight uh, time budget, let's go to the next uh, poster by Dr. Kim from the Channing. And now Dr. Rabinovich knows that she's going to be prepared to ask, as she did so eloquently a minute ago. Fire up. Information on both common and rare variants. Therefore, increasing sample size and ethnic diversity can identify novel genetic loci. In this study, we aim to identify novel genetic loci using the largest scale and multi-ethnic WGS data. After sample quality control, we retained more than 44,000 samples from 11 cohorts. For phenotypes, we considered FV1, FVC, and its ratio as quantitative phenotypes and COPD cases and controls as dichotomous phenotypes. We got a deep sequence the WGS data as our genetic data. For single brand based analysis, we performed GWAS for individual variants. Among significant variants, we identified potential novel variants after adjusting for previously reported variants within two megabases of each variant and potential causal variants using the fine mapping analysis. For the variant set-based analysis, we grouped rare putative loss of function variants by gene. Among significant genes, we identified potential novel genes after adjusting for known variants, including significant single variants in this study, as well as previously reported variants within two megabases of each gene. In the single variant based analysis, we found more than 1,000 significant variants in 21 loci. Among them, we found six potential novel loci after adjusting for the known variants. We also indicated if the variants the variants were in the potential causal variant set produced by the fine mapping in the last column of the table. In the variant set based analysis, five protein coding genes were significantly associated with the lung function and COPD after adjusting for the known variants. Here's the people who helped our study. I appreciate all the support from the people. Thank you. Okay, that was that was great. Um, can you tell us about the variants, and can you tell us a little bit about what you do when you find a very distal variant uh, where you might not know what gene it it regulates? 
and you, we know that non-coding variants can skip genes. And so how did you identify the significance of some of those? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, actually, it's, um, yeah, the slides, uh, yeah, it seems something wrong. The, the audio and the video has not synced, but yeah, sorry for that. Um, uh, so for the, the, the non-coding, uh, the variants, um, so um, we we did some of the the for the post GWAS the analysis uh, for the single variant based analysis we did some the causal variant uh, the analysis for the using the fine mapping the analysis and we did the um, the molecular the QTL analysis to find some uh, the to find some of the variants uh, which affiliated with the the, the some the with the, the significant variants. So uh, we uh, we will do yeah we are planning to do some the the epigenetic the analysis for our future analysis. Well, thanks. It's a very challenging project. And it's a good one. I guess we have a minute for any qu other questions. Okay, now we'll move to uh, the, uh, David Severson uh, talking about uh, single cell profiling of mesothelioma. Hi, I'm David from the Bueno Lab and I'll be discussing our work in mesothelioma and malignancy of the pleura. Mesothelioma has three histologic types, sarcomatoid, epithelioid, biphasic, a mixture of the two. And a ton of work has been done using microarray and bulk RNA sequencing studies to grab onto the molecular profile of these tumors. And collectively, what these have shown is that these tumors lie on an epithelial mesenchyme or EM histomolecular gradient. It's a histomolecular gradient because at the epithelial end, you have mostly your epithelioid histologic types, your sarcomatoid at the other end, and biphasic scattered throughout the middle. You can quantitatively place any of these tumors on the gradient using an E score, S score, as published by Bloom et al. And what we wanted to understand is how this EM gradient might vary across multiple samples from a single tumor, and also to figure out what could be driving this EM gradient, whether it's genetics or something else. In order to do that, we did single cell RNA sequencing of 93 anatomically mapped samples taken from 40 surgical sections. We also did histopathologic and bulk RNA sequencing analysis of immediately adjacent tissue. Here are 40 cases, and if you look at the samples we collected across the six sites, you can see that within a single tumor, there can be substantial variation in terms of its percent epithelioid content. Fortunately, we've collected a good number of single cell transcriptomes from all of these regions in order to pick apart this heterogeneity at the single cell level. To illustrate this, we can zoom in on the 32,000 tumor cells that were high quality. And what we can do is we can look at the previously published EM signatures and we can score any cell, which is a column here, based on those signatures and arrange them and see that they fall along a gradient very similar to the bulk samples previously studied, suggesting that those findings were in fact tumor cell driven rather than microenvironment driven. And in fact, actually the tumor cell expression, first principal component is this EM gradient. And what we can do is look at the genes driving that first principal component and identify a tumor-specific E-score and S-score. In future work, we're going to take that tumor-specific histomolecular gradient and associate it with the genetic features of the cells and the clones and identify if there's any genetic drivers of this variation. With that, I'd like to thank you and also all the people who made this work possible. Yeah, that's a great study, David. I really enjoyed it. But tell me a little bit more about what you think the drivers are. Um, are they from stromal cells? Are they, um, you know? Yeah, I mean, we're not, we're still not totally, totally sure. So we, we now know that the, the gradient seems to genuinely be happening in the tumor. It's not just like they, the morphology changes a bit, but then they recruit more fibroblasts. Um, although, you know, the sarcomatoid tumors do often have a lot of infiltrating fibroblasts as well as um, uh, immune cells. Um, but, you know, I, I, what we can see right now is that some things like um, some, some genes, well, I guess the, it's a, that's a long way of saying we're, we're not sure yet, 
Um, there, there are a couple of like T TGF beta like uh, molecules that are starting to come up, but I'm still working on chewing on the data. So I don't have a good answer for you yet, but it's, I mean, that's the main purpose of the study is to answer that question. Great. Thank you. And now uh, the last uh, winning poster is by David Sayer. My name is David Sear. I am a pulmonary and critical care physician and postdoctoral research fellow. And I'm gonna be talking about how we can reprogram fibroblast metabolism to pulmonary fibrosis. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF is a lung disease characterized by progressive scarring, high mortality, and only two therapies with limited efficacy. In recent years, investigators have recognized that normal healthy lung fibroblasts must shift from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolytic metabolism in order to differentiate into myofibroblasts, which are responsible for causing pulmonary fibrosis. These myofibroblasts depend on the export of lactate via the monocarboxylate transporters in order to sustain glycolysis. We found that expression of myofibroblast marker alpha smooth muscle lactin as well as the monocarboxylate transporters MCT1 and MCT4 is increased in the lungs of patients with IPF. This increased expression of MCT1 and MCT4 localizes to areas of fibrosis. We hypothesized that blocking lactate transfer would prevent myofibroblast differentiation and alleviate lung fibrosis. In lung fibroblasts exposed to TGF beta, we found that inhibiting MCT1 or MCT4 with AZD3965 or VB124, or especially the two together, mediates a shift in metabolism away from glycolysis and towards oxidative phosphorylation. We found that blocking lactate transport prevents pathologic myofibroblast differentiation. We next tested the MCT4 inhibitor VB124 in the bleomycin mouse model of lung fibrosis. Compared to mice that received bleomycin in vehicle, animals that received bleomycin and MCT4 inhibitor VB124 experienced less weight loss and significantly improved lung compliance. Animals that received the MCT4 inhibitor demonstrated significantly less histologic evidence of fibrosis. In this presentation, I've demonstrated that blocking lactate export reprograms fibroblast metabolism, prevents myofibroblast differentiation, and attenuates bleomycin-induced lung fibrosis. That's super. Um, the question is, how do you think this is happening? Um, so, so we and, and others have done studies showing that uh, metabolism is, is very intimately linked to gene regulation uh, in terms of metabolites influencing chromatin remodeling, transcription factor binding, et cetera. So can you take this to the next step to tell me what is it about metabolism that switches your genes? I, I think that's the million dollar question. Um, we're not entirely sure. And we are um, sending off some samples very shortly for some bulk RNA sequencing to see if we can uh, look under the hood a little bit. Um, I think it's also not so simple as just being a single cell that's responsible for creating fibrosis. So it's possible um, that the, the lactate that we are preventing from being exported, um, we're also perhaps preventing some paracrine effects on other cell types. Um, it's unclear. I think there, one of our thoughts to, I mean, I guess be a little more specific in answering your question. Um, there is perhaps um, some implication for HIF signaling, um, but we, we don't have kind of a slam dunk when it comes to the, the exact pathway that is um, preventing um, fibrosis by, by blocking lactate export. But I think what we've been able to demonstrate is that uh, there is an accumulate, when you block lactate export, you cause an accumulation of intracellular um, lactate, probably cause some feedback inhibition of glycolytic signaling. And I think by virtue of um, blocking that glycolytic signaling, we're also affecting other profibrotic pathways. I think that's probably about as specific as I can be right now, but um, that is something that we, that's kind of the piece that's, that's missing right now. 
in terms right. of the mechanism. But I think just finding a therapy is great. So I wouldn't minimize that at all. Congratulations. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, we're very proud of our posters, our investigators, and our and everyone. So thank you for the opportunity, and thanks for so eloquently reviewing everything. And uh, I guess we're going to a panel next. Trey. Yes, we'll uh, highlight Nora and Johanna to introduce the panel. Yep, great. Welcome, everybody. So my name is Nora Barrett. Johannes, do you want to introduce yourself? No, I'm no, the I, of Spike Vien, yeah. That's right. I'll go ahead, Nora. No, no, go ahead. Um, and uh, we're going to have a brief panel. Um, of course, our panelists are Dr. Rabinovich, uh, our st star of the afternoon, um, and also Josh Boyce, uh, Rafael Bueno, Bruce Levy, and Ed Silverman, who I trust everybody know. Um, and we wanted to discuss some topics that are um, particularly important to the group of junior investigators who are here. So we don't need to have everybody comment on every topic, but we're hoping that we might be able to cover three in a few minutes. Um, we have about seven to 10 minutes each, um, and uh, folks hopefully could chime in, but maybe we'll ask Dr. Rabinovitz if she could comment definitely on the first one at least. Um, and that is how to support and retain early investigators. Um, what has been your strategies? What has worked? Um, and what are you pushing? So thank you so much for joining us and for commenting on this. Yeah, so I think how to support them is really to invest in them. And, and once you take somebody on, I think that the institution really needs to show you that they support you. Uh, they support you by protecting your salary for a while. They support you by uh, making sure that you always have some protection and your time. And by providing you with uh, mentors who are one stage ahead of you and then maybe much more senior uh, that can really be good cheerleaders uh, uh, for, for the success and for your trajectory. Uh, I think you can learn from a lot of mentors. You can learn from good ones as well as bad ones in terms of what to do and what not to do. Uh, but I think there's, there's, there are many, many things that an institution can do to support you, to review your grants, to point you in the right direction, to make sure you don't take on too many assignments uh, uh, that you don't have time to do, uh, and to really focus your efforts. So I think choosing the right institution where you do have that kind of support is probably the most important thing that you do. I wonder if any of the panelists want to comment on how much is the right amount of protection, um, because uh, junior investigators, I think, always hear that phrase, right? Uh, don't get too diffused, don't get whatever, but how do you know when you're doing that? Um, how many administrative tasks is sufficient for them to take on? How much clinical tasks while they're trying to build their research program? I can go ahead and pick on you guys if you want. <laughs> No, I think I'm, of, I'm not afraid to do it. <laughs> one of the surest ways to sink uh, a young faculty member for their investigative career is to give them too many administrative responsibilities. And, and one of the problems with um, junior investigators is they're very talented. Um, they have uh, the ability to do a lot of things and they want to do a lot of things. And while it may be very exciting to, you know, plan the lectures for the fellows for the next year, or, you know, it, that, that should be a, a non-starter. You definitely don't want your first year or second year faculty doing that kind of thing. I would say up until the point they get their K award and probably a little bit beyond that, you need to sort of draw a line in the sand and say, no, you know, this is not in your best interest to do. And, uh, and you know, I think it's important for, you know, physicians to do some clinical work, but I, you know, how much, how much is too much? Is 20% too much? I think nowadays with, um, you know, uh, the amount of time you spend doing, dealing with your Epic inbox, it probably is too much. It didn't used to be. Now I think it is maybe 10%. And, yeah. Just to, to make a more, more general comment about uh, supporting uh, early stage investigators, I, I think it's important to recognize that every moment in your career is not uh, equally, um, uh, momentous and equally challenging. There are these key transition points as you go from the, 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 the T to the K grant, as you go from a K to an R grant. And those are really times when mentors need to step up and, and provide special attention uh, and guidance. And one way they can do that is by helping to facilitate uh, collaborations of their trainees with other investigators to help broaden their scientific portfolio, to help uh, also broaden their funding portfolio. And finally, I think that uh, there's responsibilities for the investigators, junior investigators too. They need to 
communicate openly with their mentors about their concerns. They, need, they, they should never be reluctant to talk about the practical challenges and uncertainties of academic careers, which we've all been through. Great. Thank you. Does anybody else have a comment on the paired junior senior mentoring that was mentioned earlier? Is that a strategy everybody uses? It's a common strategy when it makes sense for the trainee um, or the early stage faculty member. It doesn't always make sense, but it, when it does, um, it's one of many uh, important interventions to help early stage faculty. It's, uh, it takes a village, and one of the ways it takes a village is through uh, identifying the appropriate mentors, as, as Dr. Rufinovich has highlighted. Yeah, that's a good point. I, the question, you know, and we'll talk about that later on as well. I mean, Ed, you mentioned enhancing collaboration, uh, helping young investigators uh, seek out collaboration. How is that best done? I mean, is it uh, by by connecting the, the investigators with others, or how do you do that? Just general question for everybody. Um, I. I might start the conversation on this one, perhaps. Uh, I think that um, collaborations are essential uh, in uh, our current scientific environment and for advancing science and, have, and actually having fun. Um, I do think it's important for early stage investigators to start small, um, local, uh, maybe even vertical with your primary research mentor or a close colleague helping in that regard. But I think collaborations are all about kind of building relationships. This would happen, the more senior folks would know that this happened a lot in person <laughs> at meetings, especially small meetings or at your poster or at, when you gave a talk. Um, now I think more and more people are trying to leverage social media, social media platforms as ways to, to generate interest in the work and build relationships, but it is all about relationships. And I think successful collaborations come from clearly defining uh, authorship, deliverables, timeline, and then at, for the faculty member to deliver on those and uh, leaning on your mentors to understand what's appropriate uh, and what's uh, reasonable in terms of those. But um, the more clear and transparent the um, collaborations can be starting small, local, uh, and uh, having your mentor help to build those with you. I think the more successful you're likely to be. And I, I do think that teamwork makes the dream work uh, and it is makes science interesting and fun. But, um, you know, engaging locally for the Brigham Research Institute, the Lung Research Center, many, there are many opportunities there in the divisions and cross this wide now spectrum of lung researchers that we have even locally in our community, there's many opportunities for collaboration. That's how I would start. And I think both groups have to be interested in the collaboration and, and yeah. I think they have to be very targeted and you have to show that um, you're there with support. Even as a junior investigator, you're gonna write a grant together, you're gonna to go to the lab and learn how to do something. I think the more engaged you are, the more likely they are to work. It, you know, exactly, this does get into the, 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 the last question, but I think it's a good time to talk about it. Building a new collaboration, has costs in terms of time and in, and in terms of money. And, and you have to try to compensate for that as best you can uh, if, 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 it's, if it's really gonna work. Um, and I think you wanna try to find collaborative projects that are mutually beneficial um, to, to, to both groups. Right. But I, I've been really surprised how just a, a, a random email to, to, to someone that you find in a you know, directory has led to a, a valuable collaboration. Most people are receptive to, to being contacted about collaborations, um, at least for an initial conversation, but then you have to build on that. And, and often sharing through a trainee is, is the best way to, to build a collaboration. Uh, so those people may have the, 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 the time and the creativity to, uh, to, to build it. Any point. other strategies you've used in the Zoom world? Uh, we, we've, uh, I know both Josh and I have been invited to other people's lab meetings sometimes. I don't know whether that's a common shared practice, but it was kind of fun dropping in. I don't mm -hmm. know, <laughs> other, other formats or venues for that? 
for introducing your trainees and allowing them to, you know, make contacts and collaborating? That's really important, I think, because you, you don't just dump your samples off or you're, it's really being engaged in, in what they're doing. And at the junior level, there have to be in collaborations with among the postdocs. Um, that, that's really a team effort. And, and the team isn't minimized. It means both people contribute and both people see benefit in it. And uh, uh, so I think you're absolutely right. Going to lab meetings and getting up to scratch and presenting at lab meetings both ways is very beneficial. So it's an active thing. You know, if you have a program project grant meeting once a month with all the groups herding the cats and getting them together and getting them to talk and, you know, is, is essential and refreshing, you know. Exactly. Another strategy I found, you know, I, I spent my last 20 years on mesothelioma, but we also have access to a lot of patients with lung cancer. And so when collaborators reach out for me for doing something nifty with the lung cancer, I said, I'll give you the specimens as long as you use your technology on mesothelioma. And that's how we will, we will uh, uh, divide the publications and the grants, et cetera. And that's been extremely productive because we find we automatically get a system uh, biology. Uh, uh, so, so the, these things can happen in other milieus and uh, keep them open. Beautiful. Maybe we'll go on to topic number two, if that sounds right. Because um, we've partly covered, amazingly, one and three um, in a short period of time. And, but this is a big one, and it's future research topics and disciplines that might be transformative where would you have your eye for the next five to 10 years? This is a big one, could go many directions. For young people building their career, which way would they head if they haven't already invested? I guess that goes into the question, what kind of grants are you writing or what, what do you think about in five, 10 years? Do you know, it's interesting. We had a recruit from, from Harvard. <laughs> And not from any of your labs. Um, and he said, you address three circles. And the big circle is what's important in the world. And the second is what's important to you of what's important in the world. And the third is what do you have the skills to solve? What's important to you that's important to the world? And so I think that the transformation comes from really, um, from really seeing that. Uh, but I think if you have to pick areas that are that are ready to boom, certainly, you know, collaborations with tissue engineers, regenerative medicine, regenerating tissues and organs has to be a big one, uh, because I think we're on the brink of many discoveries uh, that we're, you know, just need an extra push in the right direction. Um, but I think the interdisciplinary approach like that, really talking beyond talking to other physicians and other basic scientists is getting out into the engineering world, into the computer science world, uh, and really talking to people who think differently but can approach your problem uh, from a different axis is going to be transformative. And, and, uh, and I think that, you know, we talk about collaborations. I think the more interdisciplinary they are, the more they're going to move the field forward but I'll let other people talk too. Yeah, question about that. So, you know, the, what happens is the language that say the other um, disciplines speak is actually very difficult to learn and actually communicate. How do you, how do, you do that? How, what do you do in those terms? Uh, do you spend time with them to learn their vocabulary? Uh, what do you do? You find common interests. Uh, every, you, you know, that circle intersection, uh, you convince, you figure out what is useful for you, what might be useful for them, and how you can work together. And that's how you learn what's possible, and then they'll be willing to collaborate on more. I've been able to do this uh, repeatedly with totally different disciplines, uh, because you can't learn everything. There is so much out there that can be applicable to biology, lung, what have you, that you just can't do it all alone. Uh, but so you just, you know, one day, three years ago, I, I uh, thought that we need to fix uh, how we do surgery and, and 
train robots, then I don't understand how the robots work, okay? I barely understand how the refrigerator works. So uh, I, I convinced uh, uh, a Intuitive Surgical uh, to uh, come up and uh, work with us on that and figure things out. That led to a grant. They gave us a robot to play with for the grant. And now they're having us uh, work with them on new technology and get it approved for the FDA for them and, and work on new teaching technologies. And it's all became because I, you, you know, I thought this could be helpful and there is no reason you can't uh, take that model and apply it to anything. You have to give something, you have to give a idea, resource, uh, expertise. You put it on the table, they'll put theirs on the table and it's a perfect marriage, if I'm allowed to use that term. <laughs> and it's neat to know, you don't need to know everything in the, those long computational equations, but you kind of need to know what they're trying to get at uh, in solving a problem. Uh, I think that's the main thing so that you do have, it doesn't have to be the whole language, it has to be enough words to get you to communicate, if that makes sense. Sure. I so, think you don't want to, uh, well, saying I don't know is a sign of strength, not weakness. <laughs> Recognizing your limits, I think, is very important there. Yeah. And tapping into each other's strengths, I think, as Raphael was saying as well. I, I mean, I, in thinking about this ginormous question, Nora, thank you very much. Um, I was also thinking about kind of machine learning, AI, big data as one area. And we're so fortunate to have the Channing and all the computational expertise as part of our community. Uh, I was thinking a little more broadly about biomedical engineering uh, and certainly what, uh, what Marlene has brought up as well. And then gene and cell therapy and moving towards kind of risk stratification at, a, at the individual or sub, subset. Then moving away from our, well, taking our blunt physiologic and clinical phenotyping and moving it into a more detailed molecular uh, genetic uh, risk stratification and maybe even uh, for treatments as well. I think there's a lot that's on the horizon in that domain as well. Bruce, can I jump in at, sorry, before you, before you jump in, can I just follow up on that for one second? Um, so when somebody comes out of the internal medicine residency training program and says, yes, I want to be involved in gene therapy, but I don't know anything about it right now, <laughs> what, how, where do you tell them to go well, in we're their trying clinical not to fellowship them. and their individual <laughs> lab training that doesn't include any of that? Well, we're trying not to send them all to Vertex. Let's just say that. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, we actually have trials of... Uh, targeted cell therapy going on now in the ICU at the Brigham. And there are many places that are doing this, of course, in other domains. So I do think that there are local resources who are thinking about this and actually even some are at the clinical um, therapeutic level in some respiratory diseases. Um, you're gonna see more and more of this happening. And the NIH is also, of course, uh, supporting this. The, BRI, and I don't know if Jackie is still on um, the line, but maybe, uh, or, or Lisa Hensky, um, one of them might be able to talk about this, but there's the, the Brigham's also developing a whole therapeutic nucleus and center around gene and cell therapy to actually expand the opportunities there. So thank you for the question, Nora. And I, I don't know whether Jackie or, or Lisa may wanna, wanna comment on that. Nope, Lisa says she doesn't have the information on that right nothing, now. Nothing to add, but I agree it's a great opportunity. Yeah, and more and more institutions, we have one as well, more institutions are doing this. And I don't think we're that far away even in CF, to tell you the truth, it's it's coming. Uh, and, and it just the techniques keep improving, the vectors keep improving, the targeting keeps improving, so. Ed, you were gonna jump in before. Sorry, I mean, just this, this issue about trying to prognosticate what uh, scientific uh, disciplines are going to transform healthcare is it's, you know, it's a risky business, right? Uh, most prognosticators are not very good, and I'm certainly not either. But, but I think this, uh, the idea that, that they're going to be 
dramatic technological developments. And, the, and those are often major catalysts for scientific progress. And those are probably happening in you know, some obscure molecular biology laboratory that we don't know about. And, and it could, like CRISPR, totally transform the things we do. But, but I, I do think that the more generally, the research programs that can bridge between computational and molecular biology are, are going to be essential. And I, we saw you know, a, a lot of that in what, what, what Marlene is doing that molecular and cell biologists benefit from the agnostic discoveries of computational researchers and computational researchers benefit from functional validation and mechanistic studies of molecular and cell biologists. You know, somewhat selfishly, I, I am optimistic that network and systems approaches are gonna give us new insights into complex diseases and that systems pharmacology is gonna help us come up with more effective drug development strategies that will work on specific disease subtypes, but, but we'll see what technology comes next. So the, the, the other question is, you know, the, again, we're talking about new methodologies that always uh, appear before we know it. In fact, there are several papers and we run into it by, you know, reviewing a grant or something. How, how do you um, kind of keep track of these new technologies? Uh, and there's a lot happening uh, all the time. Um, is there like a good way and DRI being a great, a great example. I mean, we get terms what other people do, uh, but how how do you do that in terms of uh, encouraging young investigators to um, to follow that the, the new the new techniques, new te literature, and new uh, um, uh, new field. I mean, I can jump in. You get them to review it at journal clubs so that they read the article and they digest it. Uh, you get them to set up a uh, collaboration where they get reagents uh, and protocols from another group and try it themselves. You, you know, like CRISPR, you started CRISPR I, you know, we were very ignorant of how it works. It took a long time, but eventually you're able to implement it. So uh, it doesn't never is as easy as it looks in the papers for sure. Uh, but you work together with groups and you somehow get it done when it answers the question, when it's absolutely necessary to answer the question you're asking. So it still has to be question driven at the end of the day. Is this the right technique for it? You know, we all want to do single cell. It doesn't answer everything. You know, there are limitations to everything we do. Yeah, single cell is better for raising questions. That's right. Identifying new questions. You know, it's single cell attack. You know, why are you doing it? You know, is it going to tell you that much more? Is it going to tell you which, which really being regulated? You still have to validate it a different way. It narrows down the field for you a little bit. And are there particular techniques I hear Ed talk about computational biology for sure? Um, but there are other techniques that you would want junior investigators to make sure they get under their belt in any particular period of time, if possible, so that they could be able to read where the literature is and uh, feel comfortable going forward with current techniques. My, I would say, uh, uh, my husband used to always say that he was, did molecular biology years ago, and now everything he ever learned in, in 10 years comes out of a box from Kyogen. But, but to the best that you can, you try to keep up with things. So where would that be? How would you advise people? Is there anything essential that everybody has to know? Aside from how to ask a good question, of course, that's a given. Oh, I'll, I'll jump in on that one, if you can hear me. Yeah. So yeah. my advice is rather retrospective. Every high school student should take advanced placement computer science. That should be a graduation requirement so that they learn Java and they learn something about how to actually program a computer that's so enabling for doing things in R or any other software package that you use in the future. So the problem is that if they've had no computer experience by the time they're a fellow, it's a big challenge to actually jump in then. That, that is true, but 
they need to do it. So they'll figure out a way, you know, I, you know, I agree with you. I think the more we can introduce, the earlier we can introduce it uh, to young and inquiring minds, the, the better off we are. I'm just disenchanted. Sometimes our pre-med students end up in computer science and never get to medical school and <laughs> undergraduate. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you got, you know, sort of the, there's, there's a push and the pull, but, but I think looking at what you're doing and saying that would answer that question. If I could do, if I could take all these variants and do a perturbed seek experiment, maybe I'll figure out what the pathway is that they're all trying to tell me they're influencing, you know, sort of to go beyond what your next question is, you know, where the puck is going to be next, literally, uh, in terms of uh, what haven't you answered? Uh, after you complete this study. And then it, it changes, it's going to evolve. So it's a continual learning experience. Great. You got to encourage the students or the fellows to go find the good, the good fellows will find the source of the better way to do it, the newer way to do it, the less expensive way to do it. And you just kind of enable them to do that. They, they find, did you say they find the newer and the less expensive way to do it? Yeah, yeah, because, <laughs> that's because been my experience. <laughs> no, no, but that's the point. I must they, be doing something wrong. I usually they find the better and the most expensive way to do it. Well, well, well it turns out that for single cell, you can go to MIT, work with the people there, and do SQL, show that it works as well as 10x for a substantially low, lower cost, and then do it that way. That's an example of saving tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, so uh, motivate the fellows. Uh, <laughs> the really good ones will do that. You can give prizes for saving money. <laughs> that would be a bad <laughs> investment. <laughs> Bonuses. Exactly. Don't say it too loud. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you guys. I, I think if there, if there are no further comments right now, we are right just about at the end of the time that we had allotted. And uh, we, Josh was up for giving us some uh, closing remarks. So we really appreciate everybody sharing their, their thoughts today. I just wanna say one thing, Marlene, I don't know if you remember it, but you're responsible for us having a new successful lung transplant program. I called you seven years ago about a reference and oh. you told me the truth or, oh. seven, or maybe eight years ago. That's you wonderful. told me who not to hire and who to hire and it worked <laughs> out tremendously. So thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. I didn't remember that. Who did you hire? <laughs> uh, our transplant director is Hari Malidi. Yeah, yeah. Great. From Stanford. Yeah. Terrific. All right. Well, yeah. thank you all. I have a few uh, closing remarks. Uh, this has been a fantastic afternoon, and I want to thank uh, the organizers and uh, our uh, support from the BRI, uh, Trey and Jackie in particular. Uh, Marlene, you gave a phenomenal talk, uh, and I think it was a beautiful example of you know, what a physician scientist strives for is to take a clinical entity disease of interest, dive into mechanism and eventually wind your way around to the potential therapeutic applications of your findings. And it was just a wonderful uh, way to present that and very inspiring. Uh, I also want to congratulate our poster presenters. We had a lot of you know, phenomenally interesting and very well presented uh, posters to evaluate as a committee. Uh, and I wanna extend my special congratulations to the prize winners and to the runner-ups. It was a really tough competition, but you're all doing magnificent work and it really shows the diversity of uh, strong research going on uh, here in, in the Lung Center. Um, and uh, as far as the uh, uh, panel is concerned, I'm not sure that we solved the world's problems, but I think we uh, uh, made a game effort and it was very valuable to hear everybody's perspectives. And I'm very hopeful that uh, in a year we can uh, do this conference in person 
Uh, but uh, uh, given the limitations, I think it went off very, very well. And I want to thank you all for attending and making it as successful as it was. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for making it such a wonderful morning. Afternoon. Afternoon. <laughs> thank you very much, Marlene. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Yes, many thanks, Marlene. Thank yeah, really thanks. Great. It was just terrific. Right.